completed on the day that the applications were opened with Ameris Bank on April the 3rd. Ameris changed um, a couple of steps on their application, and so we resubmitted and re we resubmitted for the revised application on April the 8th. We received confirmation of the application by Ameris on April the 8th, and um, that the application was submitted to SBA on the same day. On April 14th, we received approval that we were earmarked for the full amount. And as of today, about 10 minutes ago, we are in the electronic closing document process um, and signing those documents electronically. We will, once it is submitted and um, everything's signed, we will be receiving funding within 24 hours. So the Paycheck Protection Program, in, in general, just some information. It's a program and a loan designed to provide a direct incentive for small businesses to keep their current workers on their payroll. It is part of the coronavirus relief option. And like I mentioned, lenders began processing their loan applications on April 3rd, which is the same day that we submitted the application for TLA. The loan will be fully forgiven if the funds are used for payroll costs, interest on mortgages, rent, and utilities. And due to the likely high subscription of this, at least 75% of the forgiven amount has to be used for payroll expenses. Borrowers will need to provide documentation of these expenses and their loan forgiveness application, and we haven't seen what those loan forgiveness documents will be yet. We expect to see those after we get through the closing process and possibly maybe even a week or so after we receive funding. The first payment repayment is deferred for six months with no penalty and no penalty if we early repay the full amount. Money borrowed from the program will have a 1% fixed interest rate. There is no collateral or personal guarantees that are required. Neither the government nor lenders are um, able to charge small businesses any fees for this. And a decision on forgiveness of the Paycheck Protection Program loans will be made within 60 days of the forgiveness sub submission package. The forgiveness is based on the employer maintaining or quickly rehiring employees and maintaining salary levels. And just to note that TLA maintained full staffing even when our marinas were temporarily closed. Forgiveness will be reduced if the full-time headcount declines or if salaries and wages decrease. The loan has a maturity life of two years. So the PPP amount and the intended use is that two and a half times the average monthly payroll cost over a year, with it cannot exceed $10 million. The amount of the application and that the uh, approval for TLA to the Small Business Administration totaled $792,888. This is, um, we applied for this for payroll costs and utilities, given that we don't have any current mortgage or um, interest that would qualify for the repayment. The projected forgivable amount for TLA is about 63.5% of the total that we have applied for and been approved for, which is $503,877. So the next steps, uh, like I mentioned, we're in the loan closure process. Um, probably about 30 minutes ago, we received um, electronic documents and have began processing and signing those. We're continuing to work with our payroll processor, which is Pronos, to implement tracking measures within our accounting software so that we can see exactly the payroll costs that are related to COVID-19. Um, after we receive the documents or the information that we need to provide, we will apply for forgiveness so that we can convert this loan to a grant within the necessary time frame to do so. So the final steps, receive our determination on the forgivable amount and repay the remaining balance before any interest begins to accrue. Just another one more quick fact that I found on the SBA website today. Um, as of April 16th, the SBA had guaranteed 1,661,367 loans.
Somebody have any questions for Jessica? About the PPP? You in the room or online? Good report. I need a motion <clears throat> to accept the funds should they approve by the Small Business Administration as Jessica has laid out for us. So moved. So moved. <clears throat> Second. Second. Thank you, Jen. Second? Second. Any discussion? Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. And we're on to community development. Yes, the two items in the community development are suspension of privileges for two particular properties. They do continue in violation, and it's recommended that uh, their privileges once again be suspended. Anybody have any questions? These are two properties that have been in suspension a very lengthy time. Could I have a motion to suspend membership privileges for 27 Hemingway Circle and one windswept light? So moved. Second? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And next is the monthly security. Monthly security form for Tim. Tim. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, as you can imagine, a large percentage of our efforts have been dedicated to the COVID-19. Um, overall, March uh, statistics, we did have one, one domestic, and we only had one in April so far, so um, that's good. Hopefully you've all seen the uh, post by CCPD. It's, uh, it's a trend, not only in Jeff County, but nationally, that these uh, domestics have increased. So we've been lucky to have only two since the... Uh, um, COVID-19 started. Um, fortunately, theft has uh, been down to none as well. Um, minor theft uh, just the other day of a uh, uh, placemat at the uh, door action was taken. Uh, hit and runs, however, um, well, motor vehicle crashes have increased. We did have a hit and run of iron hydrant by uh, Brandon Berry. Um, we were able to locate the driver and they were cited for that. Uh, we did have a uh, motor vehicle crash with the vehicle versus golf cart at the Diamond Causeway and the Village entrance. Um, the resident has suggested that we look at that and uh, suggest to Chatham County to put a no turn on red there, which we've done. Uh, we also had another um, golf cart versus uh, bicycle incident uh, by the golf cart path adjacent to the exit. Um, and we're still trying to locate the owner of that golf cart. It was a previously owned golf cart that was sold and it wasn't re-registered. Um, so that's pretty much the statistics in March. Any questions? Any questions, Tim? Thanks, Tim. You're welcome. Okay. Sean, for the Delagall Underground Fuel Lines. Sean, you there? Is he, um, Carl, can you tell, or Kristen, can you tell if he is um, trying to speak? He is trying to speak. Apparently, he finished his first slide. Uh huh. Can you guys hear me now? Now. Yeah. Yeah. Now I can. Now we can. All right. Sorry about that. I switched devices, and for some reason, I wasn't coming through the middle. Uh, so in your, in your package, you'll see on page 29, uh, is the capital and staff reports for the replacement of the Delaware fuel lines. Uh, both unleaded diesel and pumps uh, with Meco Inc. for a total amount of $47,743.04. Uh, 
Um, you can see we did go up and bid with two vendors, Central Industries and, and MECO. Uh, MECO was the low bidder uh, with the total project cost of $47,743.04, which is under the budget of $52,000. Um, total project, or project cost is going to be, uh, well, let me just go ahead here. Um, if you look, the existing fuel lines at Delgo Marina were installed in the early 1990s. Uh, as were the pumps, uh, you can see the section that's going to be replaced will be from the actual pump out into the uh, area just in front of the walkway going out to um, the harbor or out to the, the floating docks themselves. This section is original, it's galvanized steel. Uh, the pumps are also original. Uh, the new regulations uh, with the Georgia EPD is that to have double wall pipes. Uh, so with the age of these uh, galvanized pipes and the age of the pumps, it's time to have them replaced. Therefore, uh, that's making a recommendation to approve a contract with MECO uh, Inc. to replace the Delaval fuel pumps and lines for a total project cost of 474304. In addition, uh, this was reviewed by the Marinas Committee, the Public Works Committee, and the Finance Committee, and all committees that uh, did approve this recommendation. Any questions for Sean? No. Could I have a motion? Was there a question? No. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the contract with MECO Inc. in the amount of $47,743.04 to replace? So moved. Third. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And does that? Bring us to Chelsea Swan. Uh, actually, we're, yeah, we're committee and special reports. Want to go through those? Or is she on? She's on. She just okay, on. great. Okay, perfect. Chelsea? Yes. Yes. Thank, yes. thank you for thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, welcome to our second virtual meeting. Um, I asked Chelsea to come because. Uh, um, this presentation, this information was given this morning, and um, I talked to the senior director, Dennis Jones, who made the presentation this morning. He said he couldn't make it, but his right-hand person, and actually he said more very positive things, but his right-hand person, Chelsea, would be able to do it at 4.30. So and Chelsea has done our hurricane town halls for the association over the last year or so, so uh, we're happy to have you, Chelsea. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me. I also have a, an assistant, five months old, um, who will likely be vocal. Um, so I just, just want to go ahead and give that disclaimer. Um, but yes, I am uh, Chelsea. What was that? Oh, okay. Just some feedback, I guess. Uh, um, okay, so yes, I have um, the pleasure of presenting this information. I have tried to update some of the slides uh, based on some uh, feedback and some content that has been updated just throughout the day. Um, and I also have some numbers uh, that I'll share once we get to some slides that have been updated as well. Um, but let me go ahead and move. Oh, perfect. So the first thing I want to talk about um, is that the CDC has updated their symptom list within the last 48 hours. Uh, so I think it's really important for you all, I think everyone can know, um, that now symptoms can crop up, you know, with two to 14 days after exposure. People are used to hearing about cough and shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, but what the CDC has added to the list is that if you have at least two of these other symptoms, you should go ahead and try to get a COVID-19 test. Fever, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, um, headache, sore throat, a new loss of taste or smell. Um, so if you guys, or if you know anyone that's experiencing those symptoms, uh, it's really important for us to push this information out because a lot of people may say, oh, I don't need to test because I don't have a cough, or oh, I don't need to test because I, I'm not having a hard, hard time eating. Um, testing is much more available now than it was. Uh, so if you know someone that needs a test, please encourage them to contact their local health department. Um, we do have that, that 911 
and two hotlines um, that they established last week that they can call, call talk to a, a Department of Public Health representative, and then they can go for testing at the um, specimen point of collection site, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. You'll go ahead and go to the next slide for me, please. So there are quite a few declarations, and the presentation that Dennis sent out earlier and, and uh, went over each and every one of those declarations that was still in effect, it was challenging to read from a screen, um, and I can send you the presentation that he had that has it all laid out, um, but the gist of it is that there, were, there are 36 governor executive orders that have been in place or are currently in place over the last month and a half. Um, he's had a lot of information. Some of those are uh, the state of emergency directly. Some of those are um, different precautions to take, you know, when grocery shopping. I mean, they are very specific executive orders and declarations. Um, in addition, we have five judicial orders. They are both for the state and county. Um, there are three Chatham County orders or resolutions. One of those was uh, what Chairman Scott put into place where um, all the point of entry screenings that he was going to try to do until the governor's uh, shelter in place order came into effect. There are 10 municipal orders or resolutions. So when the city of Savannah put out their orders, Tybee Island followed suit. Uh, so there were 10 total of those and then any updates. In total, there were 300 plus individual actions that were put into effect for COVID-19, which is really unprecedented to see 300 individual actions that need to be taken. You'll go to the next slide for me. So this was an interesting piece that the commissioners, I think, found really exciting as well. Um, um, Dennis and our team found um, that Google, if you have location turned on your cell phone, if, if, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, it will track your location. And they, go, they, they check to see which areas you tend to frequent. So they use the baseline from January 3rd to February 6th uh, to kind of give us an idea of, of the median input. And then they, they looked at the next several weeks afterwards, up until two or three days ago is the most recent data, and they found that in general, people were following the governor's order, um, especially here in Chatham County. Um, so they saw a 51% increase or decrease in retail and recreation, a 19% decrease in grocery and pharmacy, a 28% decrease in parks, a 45% decrease in transit stations. So I'm assuming Chatham Area Transit, um, Greyhound, and all of the, uh, I guess airplane would also be included in that. Um, workplace was down 43%, and then residential increased by 13%, which seems really consistent with what the governor was hoping for. Uh, so it's good to know that Chatham County was, according to these statistics, taking it very seriously. Um, it was brought up in the commission meeting that these numbers could be misleading because we don't know what the sample size is, but I think if this shows a trend um, of what other people were doing within Chatham County, I feel pretty, pretty confident and pretty happy with this trend. So this has been updated, but it was not updated until four. So you guys' meeting had just started. Um, so I will explain what this is and then go over the current numbers. Uh, so this is the Georgia situation report put out by the Georgia Emergency Management Agency once daily. And it talks about a wide range of things, as you can see. So it most notably the left side, it talks about the most impacted counties. Um, so, unfortunately, Chatham County is on the list, but it's towards the bottom of the list. It talks about the change in numbers and cases that we've seen, and also the number of fatalities that we've seen. Um, and then in red are any changes that are consistent. So, the most recent that just came out at, at 3.54 p.m. has Chatham County at 211 cases, which is five additional cases from um, the last 7 p.m. last night, I believe. 
or no, it must be from noon. They must have updated it from noon. Um, and then we're still looking at seven fatalities. Um, one of the other notable differences is that they changed the graph um, and they're stating that there are um, 4,857 hospitalizations. I was intrigued by hospitalizations and, and uh, pressed a little bit further. Are there, is, is that number indi indicative of how many people are currently hospitalized? And they said that it's actually the number of people that were hospitalized upon diagnosis. So that's not an accurate representation of how many people are currently in the hospital with COVID-19. Um, and then one of, the, one of the hot topics in the report at the top right hand corner that they always mention um, is something that's going on in the state that uh, they feel is really important for people to be aware of. Um, the, yesterday's and today's both talks about uh, public health's new antibody testing. That's something that we've seen across the country that there's a lot of interest in. And in Fulton and DeKalb counties, they are going around and doing um, household visits to try to get people to do this antibody testing. I did inquire to see if Chatham County was going to be included in this moving forward, and public health does not have an answer right now. Um, I think ultimately what they're going to try to do is see um, how it goes in and DeKalb County and make that assessment moving forward. If you'll go on to the next slide for me. Sorry, user error, give me just a second here. Oh, okay, I was like, uh oh, what happened? <laughs> there we go. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so, this has also been updated um, at the four o'clock hour, um, but the graph is essentially showing you a medical facility um, essential information. So, we are region J, so it's got the lovely little red arrow there for you. Um, but it shows you what the hospital capacity is, um, what is currently in use, and then therefore what is available. Uh, this speaks directly to what Governor Kemp was talking about in his press conference yesterday, um, saying that Georgia's capacity is, is much better than it was, um, and you can, you can see that here. So Region J, um, I'll read you the updated numbers. Um, the ER, the capacity is 301. Uh, they are currently using 63, which leaves 238 available. For critical care, currently it's 204 capability, 153 are in use, and that leaves 51 available. And then for the general inpatient beds, there's a capacity of 1,004. 565 of those are currently in use which leaves 439 available um, and again this is important because if we were to have a spike in numbers of COVID-19 cases um, or need to use ventilators or need to use those hospital beds um, this will play a critical role in us being able to combat and fight this uh, this virus So oh, this is um, a graph, you'll see two over the next two slides. This one talks about the state of Georgia, the next one will talk about Chatham County specifically. Um, when Governor Kemp was talking in his press conference yesterday, he mentioned these spikes that started to happen. You can very clearly see the first one happening right around April the 6th, where we had 1,500 cases in one day followed by April the 18th, where we had a little bit over 1,500 cases in one day. Um, there has been a, uh, a, a trajectory kind of up, um, but it looks promising if you look um, from the 21st through the 24th, there was a, a decline, thank you very much with the mouse, um, a decline through there. I think that we will continue to see um, an ebb and flow of cases, especially as testing becomes more available. Um, and, I, and you know, our hope is that it will continue to have a, a downward trajectory. So here are the, the charts for Chatham County. Um, I found it very interesting, personally, that the state's 
first peak was on the 6th of April, and Chatham County's was on the 7th of April. Um, so we are consistent, um, pretty close uh, to the rest of the state. And then on the bottom graph here, you see that upward trajectory, just like what you saw with the entire state of Georgia. Um, now, ours has not started to go back down. So the same days where the rest of the state kind of leveled off and went back down, ours is still up. Um, but, but, you know, I think that our, the hope, again, is that it will continue to, to go back down. This was something new um, that the, uh, uh, the Georgia Department of Public Health just pushed out this afternoon after commission meeting. Um, one of the questions that we were, that Dennis fielded was how many tests are, are we seeing across the state? Now, they don't have it broken out by, um, by county yet, but they have it broken out for the state. So we've had 140,000 tests completed um, in the state of Georgia with only 24,000 confirmed cases. Um, and then again, we talked about those hospitalizations being 4,798. That was hospitalizations upon diagnosis. Um, so I thought that, that was very positive information. Um, community outreach. So when you talk about a public health emergency or any type of emergency, your primary goal is going to be to educate the community on what it is that they need to do and, and what it is that they need to know. Um, so over the last month and a half, we have generated 84 social media posts. That's been our primary means of communication. Social media uh, for the emergency management agency means Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Nextdoor, SEMA alert emails and text messages, and then we also have a SEMA app. Um, and it's very exciting to say that we have reached over 1.4 million um, pages uh, just on social media alone. Um, so not including the SEMA emails, the text messages, or the app. Uh, um, that, that's, a, that's a pretty impressive spread. And some of the videos and some of the content that we've been sharing uh, has actually received national attention um, just by the fact that for the first time in the country, every single state is under a state of emergency. And um, so every state in the country is dealing with COVID-19 in its own unique way. Um, but to be able to share information that is applicable across the country um, is, is really exciting, I think. Um, I'm so sorry, she is very excited to talk. Um, yes, so media relations, um, we were able to um, create three different videos. Um, one of my favorite series, The Germ Fighting Bunch, a take on the Brady Bunch. Um, but we had a virtual joint information center, and that um, is really something that came after Hurricane Matthew here in Chatham County. Uh, we realized that there were so many different agencies and all the different government um, organizations were pushing out messaging, and sometimes they weren't as consistent as we would hope. Um, so the idea with the Joint Information Center is that we would be able to all communicate at the same message and try to speak with one voice, um, and that's something that we've really been working hard on um, with this with this uh, public health emergency. And then one feature um, was, was that we did try to work with a sign language interpreter with all of our press conferences and all of the videos that we've shared. Um, if they have um, any sort of spoken language, we try to have a sign language interpreter present. Web EOC is something I know the landing is familiar with. Um, you guys have an account that you uh, have been able to log into in the past. Um, it is our online database management system. Uh, so this is how we communicate with the state. This is how we communicate with all the different organizations that are involved in this uh, in this emergency. Um, these are just some of the numbers uh, that are pretty consistent with the large scale emergency that we have. So I spoke earlier about the specimen collection or specimen point of collection or the SPOC. This is where we are sending individuals that want to be tested free of charge for COVID-19. Um, when COVID-19 testing first started uh, 
private organizations who are trying to charge people $200, $300, uh, ask upwards of $500 for a test, um, and insurance companies weren't paying for it. So this has been um, in place since March 5th, uh, but there have been a very strict guidelines on who could be tested until very recently. Um, but if you call that uh, public health number, um, their COVID hotline, uh, you can sign up and and receive a time to show up to the Jennifer Ross Soccer Complex, and you can get a COVID-19 test. It's a very quick process. Um, all of your healthcare officials are donned in PPE or personal protective equipment, like the top right picture. Um, but you simply drive through in your vehicle. You don't exit your vehicle. They ask you all of your questions. They perform the test, and they send you on your way. Um, one of the partnerships that, that we've really worked uh, very hard on in this in this um, emergency event has been um, trying to meet the need for feeding the homeless. A lot of the organizations that spend time day in and day out feeding um, our, our homeless population have had to close their doors, specifically the Emmaus House, who feeds thousands of, of homeless individuals um, on a monthly basis. Um, they were not able to keep their doors open to follow CDC guidelines. So the city of Savannah, in partnership with SEMA and the Disaster Faith Network, were able to find uh, volunteers that could help feed uh, this vulnerable population. It's been a fantastic partnership. We're very proud of, of, of what they've been able to accomplish. Uh, to date, they have distributed 1,000 hot meals and then 1,100 meals ready to eat or MREs. Um, and those were uh, purchased by the city of Savannah through a resource request with the Georgia Emergency Management Agency. So a, a statewide and, and community-wide effort effort to, to help feed the homeless. It's been really great. And then further clarification, these are some of the churches and organizations that have really stepped up to help uh, through that uh, Disaster Faith Network, which is a new initiative here in um, Chatham County, just uh, about a year old. Um, and we still need volunteers. So if that's something that uh, you or an organization that you belong to are interested in helping feed um, feed the homeless in a in a certain area. There are two um, different feeding operations that are happening every single day, two or three times a day. Um, and you can sign up by going to the Union Mission website. Um, you can create your volunteer um, profile there and, and sign up. I can also help direct you a little bit further offline if you if you know someone that might be interested. So the isolation site, we have had um, a few different news agencies uh, get wind of this and, and have done some stories on it, so you might be slightly familiar. Um, but this is in a partnership with Compassion Christian Church. Um, the isolation shelter is for individuals who have confirmed COVID-19 and um, don't have a way that they can isolate safely. So this could be someone that is homeless, this could be someone that lives um, with a large family or um, lives in a, in a shelter to, um, on a regular basis um, and would not be able to follow CDC guidelines to um, be able to shelter effectively um, and to self-isolate. So this is a, a really great resource. We're very excited with, to work with Compassion Christian on this project. Um, it's currently set up, as you can see in that picture, for 20 people, 10 male and 10 female. Um, and it's got areas for them to be able to shower, to be able to um, feed. We're working with the Salvation Army. Um, it's not in um, it's not up and running as of right now. It would take uh, less than 24 hours to get it up and running, you know, if, if that were a need. Um, you know, the role of emergency management as a whole is to understand what's going on um, in your community, what types of things could happen, 
um, who your vulnerable populations are, and then come up with strategies to help mitigate that. Um, and this is a perfect example. So the medical overflow site, um, there was a solicitation of local hotel and motel chains to try to um, see who would be interested. We had 14 local hotels reach out to us and say they are interested in being um, a medical overflow site and this is just for individuals that are medically fragile that would not necessarily be able to be released from the hospital, but the hospital does not have the capacity to be able to handle them. Um, they don't have the bed space, they don't have uh, essentially the room for them to, to be, be effective um, or to receive effective treatment. Uh, so this is a, an agreement with a local hotel that will allow those residents to stay there They'll be staffed by local hospital employees, and um, they would be able to stay there um, until they were able to be released. Again, it's not operational, and it's hopefully something that we will never have to use, um, but our job is to make sure that those resources are in place if it was something that we needed to do. So the emergency op Operation Center has been activated at level three, which just means enhanced monitoring um, since Monday, March the 16th. Um, our primary roles and responsibilities is to gather situational awareness and uh, make sure that we're ready to go. We're putting together plans, uh, those specific plans that we talked about, the SPOC, uh, feeding uh, the homeless vulnerable population, and then supporting logistical needs has probably been the one of the largest challenges when it comes to uh, this particular emergency. Um, we'll talk about what the logistics needs were, but when everyone in the country, um, and frankly, a lot of places in the world are looking for the same products of personal protective equipment, uh, uh, finding logistics for Chatham County, Georgia, can certainly, as you can imagine, be a challenge. So part of our gaming Situational awareness is 126 coordination conference calls. Clearly, we have been very busy. Um, 17 operations calls, and those are including our municipalities, Chatham County Department, and, um, and key stakeholders. Some of those stakeholders: Salvation Army, America Second Harvest, um, agencies that have really played a large role um, in helping craft messaging and, and deliver services to clients. Um, and individuals that need it. Um, but all kinds of co coordination calls have been happening. Um, upper management calls, Georgia Emergency Management Agency calls, Dennis Jones even sat in on five different White House calls to get a better idea of, of nationwide what was going on um, and, and kind of what the plans were going to be coming down. So, EOC supported logistics, um, personal protective equipment, uh, resources that were trying to be filled. We procured a lot of those locally. Um, if we couldn't find a resource for someone locally, including our healthcare departments, EMS, fire, um, then we would send them to the Georgia Emergency Management Agency or to the State Department of Public Health where they did have um, access to the national strategic stockpile, um, which is really great. Um, but you have to think when you've got law enforcement agencies that are asking for masks and you've got fire department and EMS that respond to medical calls that need medical grade masks, even down to our local health care facilities. So long-term care facilities, nursing homes, they all needed uh, personal protective equipment so that they could maintain operations and protect their staff and their residents. Um, so in total, we have 129 requests come through our EOC. Um, we did not process healthcare, EMS, or fire. Uh, those went through the state department of public health. So these are just um, local agencies that have reached out to us directly. So we had 129. Um, 23 of those resource requests still remain open. They're still looking for those resources. Um, SEMA sourced 65 of them directly, and then 64. Um, did have to go up to the Georgia Emergency Management Agency. The county um, in, in total has spent about $235,000 um, in 
purchasing cleaning supplies and personal protective equipment. Um, just a, a brief snapshot here, we've purchased 27,000 plus masks, 7,000 plus coats or coveralls, Tyvek suits, 24,000 gloves, 500 plus face shields, 70 thermometers, and that does not include the, um, the temporary or throwaway thermometers that we also purchased. These are um, the digital thermometers that we were able to, to purchase, and then 45,000 plus cleaning products. Uh, that is a lot um, of supplies that we've been able to procure. Um, and then what I'll leave you guys with, important future dates to, to keep in mind and be aware of. On April 30th, this Thursday, is when the governor's shelter in place order is set to expire. Um, and then May the 13th is when the state of emergency is currently set to expire. Um, and we'll see, time will tell what Governor Kemp will do, if he will extend that state of emergency or if he will um, let it go ahead and lapse on, on May 13th. That was a lot of information that I kind of threw at you all very, very quickly. Um, do you guys have any questions or comments? Any questions? Great, good, great good presentation. Thank you. Yes. Any questions from our remote board members? Give them a chance. I'll ask. No, thank you. Uh, Chelsea, really appreciate it. Uh, can you comment on the state of emergency after the shelter in place expires? What is the view on that uh, provision? So the state of emergency was put in place prior to the, to the shelter in place, and really the purpose of it um, is it's several pages, um, but it, it's the same type of hurricane. It allows you to um, put in effective measures to make sure that you can you can work um, in an emergency environment. So. Um, it, truck drivers can have longer hours, uh, and emergency personnel are allowed to, allowed to work longer hours. Um, it's a lot of things that are really just kind of government ease um, to make it possible for us to, to work during a disaster study. Uh, I did, there is a graphic on social media that talks a little bit more about what the difference is. Um, and then it even goes back to the CARES Act that um, is happening now nationally. Um, that will affect and help state and lo local jurisdictions that have that state of emergency in place. Um, and that's, that's one of the criteria that we're going to be looking at. Um, so it, it's a lot of money that's tied to it and logistical components that are tied to that state of emergency. Thank you. Any other questions? Any remote uh, board member questions? I, I have one. Um, Kelsey, this is Diane Thompson. I was looking at a chart today on the um, Department of Health of the state, and they have a lot of interesting charts. And one of them was the number of cases per 100,000 population. And it seemed like the coastal county are much lower than the rest of the state. Is there any thought as to why that we're doing so much better than the rest of the state? There has been a lot of question um, as to why that is. Um, the reason Southwest Georgia um, has such a peak uh, in their cases was because they had a super spreader, is what they're calling it, um, and they had two funeral to the back um, that included a large population. Um, I think Metro Atlanta, uh, just the amount of population they have and the tight spaces that they have, uh, I think it's led to a lot of the pieces that they've seen there. But it is, it's been a little shocking, I think, to everyone that the coastal communities haven't seen the biking cases that I think they originally anticipated. And, it, and you know, the way I can mean, choose to look at it, the way that the county is choosing to look at it is that social distancing has 
has worked and that people have heated warnings here locally. Uh, I hope this continues to do so. Okay, any other questions? Okay, Chelsea, um, I want to thank you and your assistant for a great presentation, both of you. And um, once again, um, we appreciate your support and um, coming out to the landings virtually or otherwise. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. Okay. Oh, oh, what's oh, her yeah. name? <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. Let me know if you have any questions or if there's anything else that I can do for you. Okay, thank thanks you. very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. That's great. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so now we're going to go through our presentation, which isn't quite as long, but um, it is more focused on what TLA. Is doing. Carl, can you pop that thing up, please? And we might need, it might be easier to read with the light off, <coughs> at least one side. <coughs> and Carl, is that, as, is that as big as you can make that one as well? Oh. I mean, I'm sharing the PowerPoint like I always do. I'm not sure what y'all are seeing in there, but it's. I, it, it's it was wondering if it could be a little bigger. That's all. I can't make it any bigger on my end. It'd have to be made bigger on that end, if anything. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, as we go, we're going to go through this, and at the beginning uh, part of the car, click, go ahead and advance that. Yeah, uh, so some of this Chelsea already covered today, um, and she did note an increase in county positive cases. Uh, it was 209 at noon today with seven deaths, but uh, now you've got updated numbers from what you just heard from her. She also talked about the 36 executive, go, uh, go ahead, Carl. She also talked about the 36 executive orders, which is a, um, that's a lot of executive orders and, and staff, um, me, Tim, Carl, we have gone through the majority of these executive orders trying to sort through whether or not it had an impact on our community or our employees, um, and as Chelsea noted, many of them are related to internal operations um, of the state government, including emergency fund transfers and that sort of thing, loosening up regulations. Um, but the key orders were on the 4-1 four, four with the schools closing, of course, that was a big deal, and then on um, for two, the statewide shelter in place through April 30th, and then on the 8th, uh, he renewed the public health state of emergency through, the, through May 13th, and then most recently issuing the Reviving a Healthy Georgia, which is the, the terminology for the reopening of the economy. Uh, and that, um, that executive order had very specific stringent social distancing criteria and, and actually was followed up by a subsequent order that laid out um, a lot of detail about what needed to be done. Uh, last night, was that last night? I think, uh, yes, there was a press conference last, maybe it was the night before. <laughs> They're starting to all kind of run together. Um, when Ken last spoke, he talked about increasing testing sites. You heard Chelsea talk a little bit about that and strongly encouraging all symptomatic people to get tested. That's their big push right now. Test, test, test. Um, and so to that end, locally, we've sent out um, this graphic uh, to our, our community. Locally, this is the number to call. Now, uh, Kemp talked also about some state numbers and state websites that you could go to, uh, Augusta, and locations like that, but this is the first thing that any of our residents should call should they want to get tested, actually, should they be uh, symptomatic. This is for symptomatic people and then, of course, medical um, professionals. But the idea here is that as soon as you have any um, symptoms, you make the call, you're going to get screened over the phone and then they're going to give you a, um, a number that you call 
um, to get scheduled for a, an appointment, and those are free. So, um, Carl, thank you. So the next set of slides, I'm going to have Karen, our HR uh, manager, go through, and then each of the departments are going to go through their respective um, um, operations that have been underway and anything going forward. So Karen, are you there? I am here. Hi. Thank you, Sherry. I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of staffing. Um, when the departments do their presentation, they can go into more details of um, operations and how things are working. Um, but essentially, all of our departments are, are up and, and functioning and, and fully running. Um, public works and security, all essential employees, um, they are um, they are on site working. Um, security, our office manager, is splitting her time between on site and working remotely. Um, marinas are now um, operating with certainly with modifications to adhere to social distancing guidelines, um, and their office manager is working remotely also. Um, community development, we again, our office administrative assistant is working remotely, but the inspectors. Um, are able to still do all of their inspections um, while adhere, adhering to the social distancing guidelines, of course, because they're in their car most of the time. Um, community relations representative, which is our front desk staff, um, they are all working remotely, answering phones, and um, pretty much able to do everything uh, that they can remotely, either over the phone or over the internet. Um, and then finance and communications, um, and that includes HR, we are all working remotely and only coming on site as necessary. Uh, so I'm sure many of you have heard the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act. Um, there are two specific portions of this act that um, have directly affected our employees. The first one is the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, which provides 80 hours of paid sick leave for reasons related to COVID-19. Um, and then the Emergency FMLA uh, Family Medical Leave Act, which is an extension of traditional FMLA uh, that grants 10 weeks on top of the, the, the initial two weeks of emergency paid leave. That is specifically for taking care of a minor child whose school has been closed. Um, there are actually six reasons that somebody would, or six criteria to be eligible for this 80 hours of paid sick leave. The first four um, actually gives them 100% of their pay. Um, you can see the reasons up there. Um, the first one is subject to a federal, state, local quarantine. Um, the, the second is if the employee has been advised by a health care provider to self-quarantine. If the employee is experiencing symptoms and waiting a medical diagnosis or waiting for their test results, um, they do. And then, of course, if the employee is experiencing any other substantially similar conditions, um, which kind of is a broad umbrella for a lot of things there. The last two reasons um, would be eligible for two-thirds of the pay. Um, the employee is caring for an individual who is subject to a quarantine or has been advised by the health care provider to self-quarantine, or the employee is caring for a son or daughter um, whose school has been closed. So to date, we have had six employees who have used the emergency paid sick leave. Um, five of them were for reason number two, which is that they have been advised by their health care provider for one reason or another to self-quarantine, um, particularly because of their own health concerns. Um, and one person for reason number six, uh, which is take care of their son or daughter. We have five of those employees are still on leave. One employee has returned um, once their spouse was released to work. Those payments um, for the emergency paid sick leave um, are reimbursable through take, uh, payroll tax credits. Um, and there are certain IRS guidelines that we're following in order to um, get the documentation needed for that. Uh, one thing to note with the Payment Protection Act that we heard earlier um, with that, um, we it's one or the other. So either we'll get a credit through the taxes or that money that we're paying these employees on leave will be credited you know, towards that um, payment protection program. Um, it's not one or the other, or it's not both, excuse me. 
Um, our, we are, our time keeping and payroll software, Kronos, um, has been updated to track both the hours and um, the amount of money that we're spending on those. Um, and then if we choose to use the tax credit, the payroll company will file the forms for us. Um, and the final thing we did for the employees is we removed our waiting period for health insurance. We had 11 employees who were um, in that 90-day that waiting period for health insurance. Um, so we removed that, which allowed 11 employees to become eligible, and 10 of those employees actually elected benefits with us. Um, and insurance companies are waiving out-of-pocket costs for the COVID-19 treatment and testing. Thanks, Karen. Any questions for Karen? The finance department, uh, the TLA administration building is currently closed to walk-in visitors. Um, so the finance staff has been working remotely since March 25th. Um, the direct telephone lines that are in our offices have been forwarded to each of our mobile devices so that we're able to talk back and forth with residents and with staff, with each other, um, and anyone that would typically reach out to us on a daily basis. We have daily virtual team meetings via the Microsoft Teams platform, which is the same platform we're using today. We've also held a virtual finance committee and also subcommittee meetings, an investment committee, and reserve, two reserve subcommittee meetings uh, via the Microsoft Teams platform. The general ledger accounting software is uh, Great Plains, and it's located on a cloud-based server that we're able to access uh, remotely from anywhere we can get a secured internet connection. That allows us to be able to do account reconciliations, journal entries, uh, create financial reporting for month end, and any type of uh, inquiry or detail for reporting that we need to do on a, on a general accounting um, need. Our accounts receivable assistant is working remotely and on site. She is coming back and forth as needed. Um, we have multiple payment options, which has been helpful, especially since this is coming at a time period of uh, assessments still coming in for the year. Um, so they can still send those to our lockbox, still pay through pay lease online, and then continue to mail those to TLA. We have a remote desktop scanner, which is actually how we process checks um, normally in the office. And this is secure, and it's also very timely to be able to scan checks, and they they go directly to our bank, Ameris Bank, and uh, we can electronically process those and post payments to the customer accounts to be able to have up-to-date balances as we normally would. Um, we were able to send late notices to owners that still had balances. Um, assessment payments were due on March the 1st. So we sent late notices to those that still had a remaining balance via email on March 30th and April the 6th. We sent um, letters, first class letters, to those with the remainder balance um, postmark April the 10th. And that was the day that um, late payments were applied to those accounts. Monthly billing statements for the marinas and uh, assessment statements are still continuing to be processed as they normally would uh, in the office, both by email and by um, physical paper statements by our third party of print shop. Our accounts payable process is also a um, software that is based on a cloud server, so it's able to be accessed remotely. This allows us to process invoices and go through the workflow that we can that we can still get the appropriate approvals at every level of the requirement that we have in our internal um, standard documentation that we require. Instead of processing physical checks that would require signatures, we are using ViewPost, which will be used on a. Um, it's not a mandatory. Uh, payment system if we're typically in the office and we use it on a um, selective basis and the vendor wants to use that as their form of payment they can receive ACH payments or you post will process check for us and send those directly to the vendor. Any questions for Jessica? Okay thank you Jessica. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks Jessica. Sean? All right. With Public Works, our, our office is closed to all walk-in visitors. 
Uh, we are strongly recommending uh, that all residents use C-Click Fix for any major uh, issues that they're seeing throughout the community. In addition, we have the ability uh, with the PWF Maintenance Out of Work email for uh, email to be sent to all managers within Public Works. And then our phone number is still active and being monitored, which is the 598 With the addition, um, we received some complaints throughout the community about groups gathering in uh, larger than uh, 10 uh, people per area. And to respond to some of those issues, we've been, we have removed all the tables at Landings Harbor, uh, Delaware Marina, and the athletic field. And we have repurposed some of those tables uh, and then around the Port Rich facility to allow for. Uh, crews that are working to go work eat outside and to be spread out uh, to the social uh, standard. In addition, uh, we removed basketball hoops at the athletic field. Uh, actually, the hoops are still in place, just the rims have been removed. Uh, the soccer goals have been removed at the athletic field also, and from the practice soccer field and have been secured behind the local facility. Bathrooms at Delta Marina, which are located on the dock, um, were also uh, locked as there is no staff available for cleaning those facilities. The bathrooms are located at the Sunset Room, are still being cleaned on a regular basis, uh, therefore those are open, so we just ask uh, residents to utilize the Sunset Room bathrooms in that, in that area. Um, within the Captain's Lounge uh, and the observation deck uh, down at Delaval, we did remove the furniture from the observation deck. Uh, we were still having large gatherings up in the on top of the observation decks, therefore we did uh, put a uh, sheet of plywood in the block entry into that area. In addition, the captain's lounge underneath, uh, which is the screened in area. Uh, we did secure the doors uh, to prevent uh, large group gatherings in there. Uh, in addition, we have contract with Janpro to come in and do weekly applications of the virus shield. So that application to uh, sterilize and sanitize the, uh, the facilities. And as we have additional uh, people in facilities, We'll have those cleaned. So currently, we have uh, been utilizing this service in the main gate, north gate, public works building, the marina's office, and also in the TLA admin office. This building uh, we are also was sanitized now Saturday. Additional CPE you know. for that. Uh, this includes um, face masks, is really the number one item that uh, we are in the process of, of trying to get additional stock up. We are doing very good with gloves. We have a touchless thermometer. We're also monitoring our uh, staff temperatures every morning when they come in. And then, of course, uh, if we are unable to maintain any social distancing more than six feet, the, the staff that are working wearing not, uh, the N95 masks during that process. Any questions? Sean, this is Tony. Hey, Tony. This may be above uh, or uh, slightly outside the scope, but at the same time, what's the plan for when some of these aspects will be reopened or replaced? I'm gonna I'm gonna cover that right right at the end after I go through this stuff. So Very good. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Anything else for Sean? All right, Larry. Hey, good afternoon. The the Landing Harbor Marina and the Delano Creek Marina are back under. Um, they're they're back open. Uh, strict social distancing guidelines. Uh, and limited operations. Mainly the limited operations apply to the harbor um, where we have established entrance and exit foot traffic patterns uh, with signage and uh, trying to create a, a, a safe environment for the boaters entering and exiting with no cross traffic and no uh, congregating. The ship stores are closed to walk-in uh, visitors at both marinas. Uh, we have uh, closed the restrooms at the uh, on the docks, as Sean said, as well as the restrooms at the harbor. The fueling operations are back open at both locations. Uh, we are sanitizing the dispenser nozzles and anything that uh, is could possibly become contaminated we are sanitizing after every use. Um, we've also uh, purchased additional PPE for the staff and taking morning uh, routine with thermometers and taking temperatures. So moving forward with the marinas, um, the, the original approach, if I, if I could just back up and, and, and give everyone a brief 
this is what my intention was in reopening the marinas and how I foresaw um, what the operation would look like. I approach this as a, uh, a phased reopening or a soft opening, if you will, with an observation and an adjustment period to take place on a weekly basis. So our, our first week, we started out with a 20 minute launch increment, um, limiting the amount of one people, boaters that were on the property, getting them acclimated and adjusted to the traffic patterns, uh, assisting them with uh, any of their needs and trying to accommodate the best that we could in maintaining social distancing, keeping everyone safe, uh, and, and relearning the operation based on that 20 minute increment. Uh, we're currently at a 15 minute increment. We went to that in our second week of operation. Um, we also added the, uh, the fueling operations back in last weekend. They're going very smoothly. Uh, and, and then moving forward uh, into this week, before this weekend, we do plan to move to a 10 minute increment uh, and, and also move the launch hours out to four o'clock. Uh, currently we're at a nine to three uh, launch period. We're hauling boats from eight to five. So, you know, and, and then our summer schedule after Memorial Day or before Memorial Day, we will implement our summer schedule, which will allow us to operate uh, eight to six on the weekdays and eight to eight on the weekends. And we will adjust accordingly as long as we can all stay safe and manage that uh, you know, with social distancing, any of the guidelines and, and parameters that are we still are required to operate under are what we are operating under. Um, so uh, the, the reservation schedule right now, it, it does go through boat cloud and, and I would very much like to see as well as the, the rest of the staff see it maintained under boat cloud. Um, you know, we're working with the, the software provider to prevent overbookings or multiple bookings by uh, boaters. Right now it, it's unmanaged. It, it, they can make as many reservations as they want, um, but there is a new software version that we're looking at that we can expedite uh, into place to alleviate that issue coming up so that it's a, a, a better platform, fairer to more, uh, especially the weekend boaters. The weekdays, it doesn't seem to be an issue, but on the weekends it does. Um, so based on that, let me just give you a, a quick synopsis of what our day looks like. Based on the number of boats that we're launching today with on a 15 minute increment, Okay, what that looks like for us, okay, that's four boats an hour. That's 24 boats in the six hour launch window that we've created. You might step back and go, well, that's not a lot of boats. Well, it's not. But the thing that we have to understand is that one boat is moved minimum two times a day and possibly three, three times a day. So the boat goes in the water, the boat has to come out of the water. And then most likely it'll go to a wash rack. So now you take that 24 bolts, boats per day and multiply it by three. Now we've moved 72, 72 moves. Moving forward into a 10 minute increment, we're going to be looking at six boats an hour, uh, pushing it an hour out up to four o'clock. Now our launch boats possibility per day would be 42. Now what does that look like in an average day we're operating from nine to four in our launch schedule. That's what, 102, possibly 126 moves per day. And on an average eight to five day, we're moving a boat every, every hour, we're, we're moving 12 to 14 boats, whether they're going in the water, whether they're coming out of the water, whether they're going to a wash rack or what have you. So that's the, that's basically the, the you know, the parameters that we're working under, uh, you know, it's not in a huge amount of movements, 
it's not unmanageable, but the, but the thing is, is we have to maintain the social distancing. We have to get beyond this COVID-19 shutdown uh, of the country and get things moving again because one employee case of COVID-19 will shut the entire marina's, boat marina's operations down for a minimum of 14 days. We cross train our, our staff, we work at both locations and, and all, of our, all of our staff are back on the job and they're working under these, under these conditions. And in my opinion, they're doing a fantastic job. We're getting a lot of support from a lot of boaters. There are some things that we need to improve on and we are moving forward with that. Okay, questions for Larry. Board member Chair, I have a question, but I have a, uh, an observation. Larry, you and your staff have done a great job, and I've heard from, from numerous people, uh, several on the Marinas Committee, about how difficult of a job you've undertaken by managing the organizational logistics, and you, you've done a superb job. Of course, you've tweaked as you've gone along, and I think that you've addressed the needs uh, as best you can in mind the well-being of staff and voters. So uh, my hat's off to you. Great job, Larry. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay. All right, Larry, thank you. And uh, now we'll move on to community development. Is Morgan on the line? Kim, did you send her the link? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's take a look and see if she's Hi, good afternoon. Um, we have development staff are still all working remotely with the um, exception of our inspectors. They are working from their tables. Uh, the private property maintenance standard violations inspections are still being completed with obviously our staff being safe in our vehicles and using social distancing when they need to get out of their vehicles. We have seen an increase in volume of covenant concerns uh, being reported by C-Click Fix, so we're able to respond to those and um, figure out solutions. We are also doing all of our follow-ups and courtesy calls um, being conducted via email or phone call. The Architectural Review Committee meetings are being held on our regular schedule, and uh, that seems to be going very well. And our ARC final inspections are being completed with social distancing when structural inspections are needed. We have seen an increase of residents submitting online applications with um, exterior paint and maintenance notifications as they work around their homes during this time. Yeah, um, I'll just add to that, you know, I think Jessica, when she was doing the financial report, talked about the revenue being a little bit lower. And um, a or C, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing 20 applications a meeting. So it's like the pace isn't slowing down, but, um, you know, we've now seen a transition. We had, uh, we're having fewer new builds, which are obviously higher fees, and we're having a lot more paint and maintenance applications. So really interesting to watch the, the change there. So any questions for Morgan? Okay, um, so next we've got Hard Rock Cafe. Oh no, Hard News and <laughs> social media engagement. Yeah, this is uh, uh, Carl here. So we're, we're doing a mix of uh, trying to provide the factual information that the residents need and are looking for, but also some lighthearted uh, postings. More so the lighthearted on Facebook. We, we put a book on there and leave it a little bit more of the harder news on. Uh, the uh, email bulletins, the blast, the Friday e news, that kind of thing. Uh, certainly, in this new time, uh, everybody being stuck at home, we want them to share the hashtag landings life at home and really get into some of that. So, we've been having some uh, good success with that. We've also continued collaborating with the Landings Club and the Landings Company about making sure we're um, on point with our messaging and, and, and we're not going out at cross purposes with what we're uh, telling people and what we're sharing with them. For community programs, certainly it's been challenging with that uh, since we've had to cancel all the programmings and reservations and all. Uh, but we've been trying to do some more things online. We've set up a, a class of 2020 
parade for May 9th, and uh, we're working through that and the logistics of that uh, right now. We've started up some new things. Uh, we used to put out a, a monthly calendar of here's what's coming up. We changed that to window to the world of here's some different things you can go and see and do while you're stuck at home. Uh, one thing that started up, our community programs manager, Kristen Penny, just started up backyard biology. She's done a couple of these. We've had a good, good uh, success. And, uh, she just gets out of nature in her backyard and does some teaching lessons about live oaks and last uh, lizards, you know, so it's, they, they have, been, have been well received as well. So again, just trying to do a mix of uh, here's what you need to know and don't go crazy while you're stuck at home. Okay. Thanks, Carl. Any questions for Carl? No, but I, I agree. <coughs> Kristen's uh, backyard biology is really fun. It really is. Thank you. All right, uh, Kim, community relations in the court. Well, community relations, um, we actually close to walk in traffic in the um, administration building, but everyone has had all of the telephone calls transferred to their mobile devices, so they all answer phone calls. And I tell you, you know, we may not have walk in traffic, but we doubled our phone calls. So. Um, the great thing about that is a lot of the um, procedures that actually happen, they do online, via email, or through our website, and now we've added and enhanced some of the forms that we already had uh, to help make that a lot easier for the ladies while they're at home. Um, they do come in uh, three times a week. They rotate and come in Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to pick up mail and to fill in any gaps that may, um, may come, come up during the week. So Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, they're here because uh, the USPS will not deliver if the office building is closed. So um, in any other special situations, we've been handling those on a case-by-case basis. OK, any questions for Kim? Thanks, Kim. And uh, Tim, security. Yeah, this is uh, Tim Cook. Um, security department is really fully operational. Uh, we went down to about 75 percent staffing levels. Uh, several of the officers were out for various reasons. Uh, one was the spouse's possible exposure. Again, he has returned to work, and others were just um, high-risk categories, and they opted to stay at home. Uh, officers are adhering to CDC guidelines for essential staff. We are checking the temperatures of staff members when they arrive to work, as well as uh, you know all the other CDC guidelines. They do have um, masks and um, gloves for PPE. And they're responding well to the increased workload. It's interesting, um, if you look at the statistics overall, the, uh, uh, they're down for the month. Um, however, uh, you know, um, our responses have been taking more time for um, incident, if you will. Um, and as you, as you can imagine, uh, the um, amount of um, interaction for golf uh, rules and fractions has increased. Um, to give you a brief idea, uh, TLC rules violations uh, for the period of March 10th to April 15th last year, we only saw three. This year, from March 10th to April 15th, we increased to 29. Medical calls with transport dropped from 70 to 42. Um, and our information reports have increased from 8 to 26. Uh, so, like I said, um, you know, thefts and burglaries, things like that, we, um, we're lucky so far. We haven't seen a huge increase in that. Um, but we are, you know, trying to curb that the best we can. Vandalism um, has increased slightly uh, just today. As a matter of fact, we uh, documented a bench at the uh, kids' fishing lagoon that was pretty much destroyed. Uh, and as Sean, mentioned earlier they put a uh, plywood board up at the uh, Delago Marina to keep people out from the uh, observation deck and gathering up there and, um, that's been uh, broken a few times so uh, but overall staff has responded to it and doing it well um, we are developing a request for proposal for contract security for staffing entrances um, initially you know I thought that the, uh, uh, the thefts uh, not only for us but in the county in general would increase they haven't particularly seen that. Um, it's more domestic related stuff that the county's seen, so let's hope that trend you know, continues. Again, uh, all the staff has been issued PPE, and uh, we're pretty good. We just ordered another, another um, 
set of uh, masks, so I think we're going to be okay. Uh, there is um, some thought, though, that um, with the businesses reopening, there might be a resurgence for that demand, so we'll have to keep our uh, fingers on the pulse there. Uh, the senior briefings, we've attended all of those. They were held at being held on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then uh, just this week, they started just on Mondays and Thursdays. And that was that, and, sink, Tim, that was that uh, the 17 ops group um, meetings that Chelsea noted when she was going through her, her briefing. We participated in those. Yes, and then we've also had uh, eight emergency action team and those team virtual meetings. Um, and they varied. Uh, they were on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and the uh, last week was on a Friday. So we do those when pertinent information is available. We'll have another one this Friday. Okay. That's it. Security the questions. Okay. Thank you, Tim. You're welcome. All right. Uh, and last but not least, to wrap it up. Sure. Um, Sorry, I did think of a couple of questions for Larry, if he's still on. Oh, I, I'm sure he is. Larry? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Larry, Tony, appreciate it. Hey, Tony. Uh, tough first month and a half or so. Um, can you kind of comment on your philosophy as to why we're only 9 to 3 and then moving to 9 to 4? What? Why do we need that extra hour on both end to move boats only out of the water? Well, we typically get a resurge. We get a surge of boats coming back at the end of the day, and in order to keep the dock free enough for people to come in, and remember, we're we're not providing dockside assistance, so we're we we want the boater to come back, tie the boat up themselves, so that we don't have any contact with it. In order to do that, we have to have clear dock space. In order to keep up with it, we have to shut our, our launches off. And we chose 3 o'clock to give us a two-hour window to keep up with the boats. And I'll tell you, Saturday we moved to about 80 boats, and the majority of that was after 3 o'clock. Um, the morning delay comes into a play where we have a number of boats that are they come back after we after we close at five, and they're and they could be staged in on the field dock, in the launch dock, you know. So it's just a matter of being able to clear the docks in the morning, clear the wash racks, and then start launching the boats. Larry, well, I'm not sure that I completely follow. Uh, you know, you're launching 24 boats a day, and you took 80 out. Well, moves. Total moves. Total moves. Each, each boat is moved a minimum of two times and possibly even three times during that day. I, Depending I understand on those are not, washer. you know, the reality is we're going to get to a couple of hundred boat moves a day over the summer. And, yeah. Uh, it, well, hopefully during the summer we won't be, well, let's, I, we don't, we don't know. We can't. We cannot <laughs> determine what's going to happen with this, right? But the idea, and as he said, it was a phased approach to making sure we could still do the social distancing that was necessary, and it's kind of step at a time. So, you know, I think what what Larry is talking about here is continuing to accelerate that, and you know, going another hour and doing it gradually so that we don't have missteps that we cannot correct. So um, I, I think I hear what you're saying. Um, and it, it, Larry, how many of them are three? I mean... Should be only one. Well, I would, if I had to guess, I'd say probably 75% I'll yeah. move three times. Well, yeah. Tony, why are you saying it should be only one? No, it should be everyone. Oh, First, everyone. I, I right. would imagine almost everyone puts their boat on the wash rack and at least rinses out the engine before they put it back in the rack. And so, the surgeon. So, right. okay. Um, so I, you know, just kind of a comment as a, as we're all aware, I, I agree with the staged approach. I think that's wise. Uh, but there is a significant amount of frustration and pent up demands that's out there and it's only growing uh, due to the lack of capacity 
So if there was a way to stretch those hours out, uh, that would be very beneficial. I, I think it would go a long way. Yeah, and, and we do plan on doing that uh, starting this, before this weekend, we're gonna move our launch times to 10 minute interval. And we're also going to add that extra hour on the end of the day, so we'll be, we'll be launching from nine to four and, and, you know, as, as we think, we see things smoothly going, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to extend that. When we get into our 9 to 6, you know, we, we could be launching from 9 to 5. Uh, 9 to 6 on the weekends. Okay. Uh, I do think that's positive momentum. I'm, I'm still not... I don't know that I'm completely on board or follow the hour that it takes at the beginning or the ending, or maybe in, in agreement with it, but um, I, I understand what you're saying. Can you talk a little bit about limiting or what type of changes are you looking at regarding the reservation system? Well, it's going to allow, from what, what I'm, the feedback that I'm getting from Boat Cloud Software Developer is that um, you know we can limit the amount of active request by in, by uh, the boats, uh, so they don't have 30 days of solid booking uh, a book, you know a launch every day of the week for a solid month or every weekend day for three months, and that's preventing others from getting their launch in that may only boat, you know, two or three times a week, and most of those are one day on the weekend. You know, I can jump in real quick, Carl here. So not being a resident here, but belonging to Freedom Boat Club, they limit you to no more than four reservations at a time, and of those, no more than two on weekends, and they can't be on the same weekend. So you could have four, but not two in one weekend, and not four weekend days. So there's different, you know, models and stuff out there that we could take a look at. Mm -hmm. So my point there is, I'm not sure what is quote fair, because I understand we mm -hmm. don't want one person to monopolize slots every day, but I can't really imagine that that's happening. But we also don't want to turn into Freedom Boat Club because there are reasons why we have boat owners so that they can use their boat at their discretion and their frequency. So it, you know, this is a double-edged sword, and realistically the solution is probably much more in regards to you know, the actual capacity of the marina rather than it is the software. Um, so we have 200 boat, 200 how many boats in the dry stack, Larry? Over two, 256, 257. Oh, okay. So you, you cannot, yeah. You cannot in a single day, but well, I guess you could, but you'd be you'd be working nonstop for probably a twenty four hour period. Put every single one of those boats in and out, right? But not everyone's gonna ask. I get it. Yeah, but but the, the issue there is on a beautiful summer day you'd think the majority of them would. And so But we don't have this issue over there. I that's day. right. That's right. That's right. So, so I think what, what you're gonna see is you know, our original time was five, uh, roughly five minutes per launch, four or five minutes per launch. And so, you know, what he's saying is we'll continue to move that and we'll continue to move the time of day. And by the way, you know, by Memorial Day, <coughs> it's longer anyway. And we were talking about having a much longer day to begin with, which is why we hired more people, right? right. And so, you know, staggering. So it's a work in, in progress, and um, I understand. Yeah. But all I'm saying is we there right now. This is one of the few true amenities, benefits, and features that most people out here who are affiliated have the ability to have. And so I think you know any way we can go above and beyond to enhance their ability to use it. Uh, we really should be looking at. And lastly, in regards to, is there the ability to kind of move a couple of boats over to Delegal if someone wanted to? 
Larry? I'm, I'm sorry, it's difficult to hear you, Tony. You said something about moving boats to Delagon? Yes, if someone just wanted to temporarily do that, what was that capacity? I, it's my understanding Delagon said 100%, but there is some, let's say, unused areas. Or are there? Yeah, well, the report that came in at the end of the week last week said that we were at 100% capacity. Uh, I did visit with Evan uh, yesterday, uh, and we, we spoke about a couple of things that we could do to possibly free up some space. Um, uh, and, and we're gonna and we're gonna be looking into that before the weekend. So, yeah, I mean, you know, a, a simple call to Evan, he'll he'll find a spot. You know, if if there's something available that will work for the customer, you know, we can we can move boats back and forth. I don't I don't see an issue with it. Thank you. Larry, I think, and Sherry, I think one thing that that we're dealing with right now is we're still under under social distancing. I talked with some folks at Lake Lanier that said DNR, they're actually checking, stopping boats and checking if there's more than one person on a boat. They're having people present uh, identification to show that they live in the same house. So they're being very strict on Lake Lanier in many cases. And here, it doesn't seem that we are. I think we're dealing with, uh, the weather's been nice, people have been cooped up, they want to get out on their boats, and sure, we'd like to accommodate them the way we've done in the past, but this is an extraordinary time, and we're just very fortunate that we live in such a wonderful place, and we, we all want to get out. Uh, the sailing club hasn't had a boat out uh, during this time at all, and I've got sailors who'd like to go out, I'd like to go out. But we just have to realize that uh, these are extraordinary times and we sure have a lot better than many places have. So sometimes we just have to, uh, uh, as the saying is, grin and bear it, so to speak. But I, I do think that uh, the marina staff has looked at some ways of, of making boats more accessible to boat owners. And it's not perfect, it won't be perfect. Uh, and until we get through this, it's going to be, it's going to be painful. And we're just going to have to deal with that uh, with a smile on our face the best we can. Okay. Any more questions for Larry? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. And Carl, if you could go ahead and move to the last slide. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so as I mentioned before, and Tim reiterated that uh, we're participating in the SEMA operations group conference calls, and you saw last week a PowerPoint presentation where we talked about the members and the stakeholders of that group. Um, many of them are, are cities, um, and certainly a lot of the county agencies are there as well. All of the, the participants in the SEMA Ops group conference calls have implemented very similar measures to what we're doing. Um, remote working, everything that you heard from staff, they, they are taking those kinds of actions as well in their respective organization. And um, they all also confirm in yesterday and, and then again um, this morning, Dennis Jones confirmed it, that everyone is planning to go forward with the same plan, meaning that until May 13th, we're going to continue the measures that we have implemented as far as overall TLA operations. Likewise, the counties in the same spot, the cities are, are in, in the same um, same mindset as well. Uh, that's the expiration of public health emergency. Our role, in, in conjunction with SEMA, is to follow very carefully the case trajectory and, and see if it is going in the right direction, which of course is downward. Um, you saw the slides that Chelsea showed, and at this particular juncture, 
we haven't had a 14 day period of declining uh, uh, caseload. So um, we will continue, basically what we're doing are, are implementing and have implemented the 20 requirements that were in the governor's executive orders for businesses to reopen. Um, and that's where we are. We will, if something changes between now and May 13th, obviously we will take appropriate action, but um, absent that, we will continue our current protocols through May 13th and, and um, continue to monitor the overall situation. Our priority is and must be our resident um, health and safety and our employee health and safety. So that's the focus for TLA. Okay. Any questions, any comments? Remote members? Apparently none. Are they all that still there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe. They're just sleeping. They're yeah. Sleeping. Were they? Were they? Good? I'm here. Cocktail hour. This is cocktail hour. Oh, okay. Sorry. Permission to leave. Curbside. Curbside. All right. So. Okay. So that um, the there are no questions, then uh, we are. Board committee and. Board committee and board special, committee and special reports. reports. Correct. Any committee have a report? No. Okay. We'll move on to directors' comments and questions. Uh, let's start out remotely. Any director have a comment or question? Hearing none, I will move into the room. Any present director having a comment or question? Uh, I just have a, a comment, and that is that in regard to the property maintenance issue, uh, as chair of the, of the governance committee, if people are having difficulty keeping up with things, they need to contact TLA and make accommodations. But we cannot, as a community, allow the properties to go down because of the situation. And as a governance, that's, that's important for people to understand. The other thing is social media has an opportunity at this point in time to be very active since people are there. There are some things we can do about the, inside the gates and some things we can't outside the gates. We had a, a incidence of trees being taken down by merits. It's state owned. It didn't matter whether we were a city or what. We had nothing to do with their ability to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the rumble strips have now been taken care of by the county. That's the county's road, that's not ours. It's outside our gates. So the issues that are now on social media about what happens next are something that you need to address with the county if you have a concern. Uh, and finally, uh, and, and that is gonna be something that's gonna happen. And uh, I just thought it was time for people to understand there are certain things that we as a board can do but there are other things that need to be done by citizens who have concerns where it invites outside our gates. Thanks, Jim. Any other comments or questions from directors? Uh, yes, I'd just like to compliment Jessica and her team for jumping on the PPP and uh, for staying on top of the financial matters during this time. And uh, we will prove to be good stewards for it and uh, treat it what it is until notified otherwise, but thought that was uh, a good effort. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Anyone else? For the President's report, I just have two quick things. One is I would like to thank all of our employees who are working both on-site and remotely. They're doing a great job. Business continues in a pandemic and they're doing it in a way they're working so well that we forget they're there at times, but we certainly appreciate their efforts, so thank you. And to the class in 2020, congratulations, it isn't ending the way you had hoped it would, um, but it doesn't diminish your accomplishments at all, and hopefully you will participate on May 9th in the parade so the community can, can give you due recognition. 
Thank you. If there's nothing else, a motion to adjourn to executive session. So moved. Second. Sean and Tim, make sure Second. you stay. Uh, 